Now I want to introduce to you our brother Jerry. I'm Johnny Cash. Glad to be at UCLA Penitentiary. Largest penitentiary next to Berkeley Penitentiary in California. Even more inmates than Folsom. <laughs> I get, isn't that amazing? At Santa Barbara, that was really incredible. They banned me from speaking there so there's not a riot. So I don't speak so they got a riot. <laughs> If I had spoken at Santa Barbara, there wouldn't have been a riot! That's just like that trial in Chicago. They decided the eight of us, not because they want to get eight of us to jail, but because they want to get all of you to do nothing. I want you to cut your hair and stop smoking too, and stop, stop running the streets. So they put the eight of us on trial so there wouldn't be no more riots. It's what they call deterrent. So after they got the eight of us in jail, they got a thousand riots as a result of that. <laughs> when, we, when we got the sentence, old Julius L. Brother Hoffman gave us the opportunity to make a statement. That's free speech in America. Being allowed to make a statement to an empty courtroom when you're going to jail for five years. So I tried to give him a copy of my book. He refused, and I said, Julie, you're inciting more riots than we ever could. You're the nation's number one yippee. We got to thank Ronald Reagan, too, for all his riot inciting. He's the nation's number two yippee. And all those others. <laughs> now here was a regents meeting going on somewhere else in California. But we got a few messages for the regents that have come out in this rally. First of all, they're parasites. They ought to get the fuck off every campus in this country. Regents and trustees. And if they don't go off on their own accord, we'll drive them off. But they're nothing more than parasites. Greedy motherfuckers. And all they want to do is get us to get on our hands and knees and respect them like good slaves and good prisoners and live the same miserable lives that they lead. What's going on back there? Same thing? Speaking of that, I, sh I don't know where to, you know, so many things to talk about, I don't even know where to begin. I should say that I'm not per per permitted by law to make seditious speeches. Uh, one of the conditions of being out on the streets is that the appeals court said that the seven of us who are out, Bobby Steele's in jail, I'll talk about it in a second, the seven of us are not allowed to make seditious speech. Now if there are any lawyers here, maybe they can help me out and tell me what a seditious speech is. I don't know what a seditious speech is. I don't know what's legal and illegal anymore. Do you know? Can I say burn down the schools? Is that legal or illegal? I don't know. It's, I said it, so it must be moral or legal. Now, legal, sedition speech means any speech that Richard Tricky Dick Nixon don't like. So this is going to be the most sedition speech anyone ever heard, because he ain't going to like it. We are illegal. I'm illegal. Everything I do is illegal. Everybody ought to try to make themselves illegal. Permanent criminals. They're all criminals. In this country, the criminals are the heroes. And the people that have power and to create the laws and sit in the, sit in the judicial chairs, they're the enemies. And that's why the Yippie program is open up every jail, free the prisoners, and jail the judges. <laughs> jail Julius Hoffman. But Dave Dillinger was sentenced to jail for four years for standing up and being a human being in the courtroom. He said that he wished that every judge in this country could go and could spend some time in jail and see what it's like to sentence a human being to jail. Just experience the reality of being behind bars for years and months and see what it's like. 
And you know as well as I do, many of you in jail, hope you all have, if you haven't, you ought to hang your head in shame. The 90% of the people, the eyeballs in this country, are black and brown. 90%. And 10% of the population is black and brown. That's what the jails are. The jails are concentration camps where white society puts its black people. And that's why every one of you whites out there are going to break down every jail and free the prisoners. Because it's your parents that put them there. It's the trustees and jury often that put them there. Now, someone just shouted, Carol, my mother, and that was Kim Agnew, who I bring with me to all the rallies. You know Kim Agnew, now Kim Agnew wanted a march in the moratorium. Read that in the paper. And Spiro Agnew said no. A father must exercise discipline over his kid. We heard that before. A father has lived a long life and knows the right and wrong, where to draw the line. After what is a 15-year-old girl know? And so Spiro Agnew took Kim Agnew and locked her up on November 15th. He locked her up in the bathroom in her home in Washington. And the 500, the 500,000 people that marched on Washington on November 15th should have marched on Spiro Agnew's home and broken down the bathroom door and free Kim Agnew! Free Kim Agnew! Free Kim Agnew! Kim Agnew! Free Kim Agnew! Spiro Agnew says someday Kim will be able to grow up and be a mother and she'll be able to tell her kids what to do. Well, we're going to get stolen with our kids. We're going to take acid with our kids. Our kids are going to tell us what to do. Because the leaders of the revolution are seven-year-olds. Seven-year-olds. And you know what happened um, in Stanford, Connecticut? Now, a lot of people here won't like this. But I'm going to tell it anyway, you got to relate to it. What happened in Stanford, Connecticut six months ago? The editor and publisher of Reader's Digest. You read that pornographic left-wing sex don't brag? <laughs> the editor and publisher of God, Mother, and Country, Reader's Digest, was giving a speech to a, a bunch of businessmen. And he was running down the generation gap. And he was saying that we have to open up the dialogue with our kids. We have to understand that our kids are trying to tell us something. <laughs> our kids are trying to tell us something. They've got some real grievances and we've made some mistakes. They're trying to tell us something. We've got to open up our ears. But communication is a two-way street. Our kids have got to listen to us, too. They've got to realize that we created this wonderful world for them. And if it weren't for us, they wouldn't be here. They wouldn't have their clothes. They wouldn't have these universities. They wouldn't have all this stuff. And he got a big standing ovation. And then he went home, and he met a 16-year-old, long-haired, maniac kid. And around 11.15 at night, this long-haired kid took a kitchen knife and knifed his father. Now, when you crawl that or boo that or mourn that or whatever your attitude is toward that, that's reality in America in 1970. How would you like to be the son or daughter of the editor and publisher of Reader's Digest? How would you like to have Spiro Agnew for a father? <laughs> the reason that we were on trial in Chicago for five months, I sat there for five months, it was like going to school. We fall asleep in the courtroom and the marshals would come over and say, you can't sleep in the court, you can't sleep in school. We sort of hunch, you know, we fall to the chair and put our feet on the table and, the, and so forth, and the marshals would come over and say, you might get a hunchback, you can't, you can't slide in the chair, you know, you got to sit up straight, pay attention. It's like being in school all over again, and old Julius said up with the McGoo Hoffman was like any professor, any teacher, any of you had ever had, you know? And um, I sat there for five months, and I don't know what the trial was all about. I read the indictment 30,000 times, and I still don't understand it. Crossing state lines with the intent of inciting a riot, 
What's a state line? State lines don't exist. I don't believe in state lines. State lines are bullshit that these professors and deans teach you to clog your mind with nonsense. You feel any different when you cross a state line? <laughs> the only purpose of a state line is to give the FBI a job. <laughs> Because when you cross the state line, then the FBI can tap your phone and follow you in. Where's the FBI agent here? Raise your hand, FBI agent. Are there any FBI agents here? I don't mean yippies, I mean it. You see, you see, you think it's the FBI is ashamed of itself. It's ashamed. You don't know, feel well, there's a lot of FBI agents here. They're looking for a weatherman. And they're all here, the weatherman, because we're all weathermen. Me out, so I'm going to be going around a stream of consciousness. So if I drop a point, just tear out that page. <laughs> this FBI agent came to the stand, this punk, and he would understand that he's given evidence against us. And he said in his testimony that Defendant Hayden said we got to fuck the convention. And then we picked up his FBI report to when he types for Frico, Jager Frico. And we read it over and it didn't say that the convention there was no such language in it. And old Bill Kutzer, he almost wet in his pants because a lawyer with a contradiction, he saw a contradiction between testimony and a, and a written statement. He jumped to his feet and he said, did you say that Aiden said fuck the convention? Why didn't you write it in your reports? And the FBI agent looked down on the floor and said, you have to understand FBI policy. <laughs> we have young girls the type of reports. <laughs> and the FBI has a policy against putting obscene words in its reports because we don't want to embarrass the young girls. So you see, we got nothing to worry about. They can't even report what's going down. They can't even collect any intelligence against us because they can't report this rally. They can't report it. I just came from Nashville, Tennessee. Now, Nashville, Tennessee, you know where that's at. Let me tell you that in Nashville, Tennessee, there are 10,000 motherfucking long hair, sex, dope maniacs with southern accents. <laughs> 10,000. And we had a march on the Capitol building. We were protesting the arrest of the Knoxville 22. Everybody here ought to get into a rock band. The Conspiracy 10 is the hottest rock band in the country. Not every city's got its own, you know, number, every rock band. You know, get a joint group. Anyway, we were down there protesting the arrest of the Knoxville 22, and the 10,000 of us marched on the Capitol building. And I got up there and I said, we ought to greet Governor Wallace appropriately, and 10,000 people chanted for 15 minutes, fuck George Wallace, for 15 minutes. And then someone else shouted out, fuck Governor Ellington. I never heard of Governor Ellington. <laughs> There's just so many fucking people to fuck, I don't even know where to begin. So many fuck Governor Ellington. Someone said, fuck John Mitchell. Fuck Bill I goes on and on. We had to stop it. We'll get to that later on today. And we'll do, we'll, 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 we'll do on who we have to uh, publicly take care of. <laughs> I was in Salt Lake City, Utah. Salt Lake City, Utah, home of the Mormon Church. It's a crowd of about 5,000 long-haired maniacs, sex dope fiends, and for five minutes they chanted, burn down the Mormon church. <laughs> but we know that the church is the institution most responsible for racism and war and poverty. The church is the first institution responsible. People ask me, people ask me, what's going to happen after the revolution? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to tax the motherfucking Catholic Church. That's the first thing we're going to do. Talk about parasites. And the Mormon Church doesn't allow black people or women to rise, to get to become a, uh, whatever they call it, a priest or a member. 
So in Shannon, in Salt Lake City, it's happening everywhere. You saw on TV the other day where Governor Wallace came on TV and he was shouted down in five minutes by long hairs and blacks. Because the reason we want trial in Chicago is because we're guilty of the most serious crime ever. We're guilty of a sexual offense. We're guilty of molesting children. We're guilty of child molesting. We're guilty of corrupting the morals of youth. Federal marshals who police that courtroom in Chicago used to stop us in the halls, call us aside and say, hey, Jerry Abbey, can I have your autograph for my kid? <laughs> my kid wants your autograph. And then five minutes later, they push us into our seat. They know that every baby born in this country is a yippee and a panther. And every person that dies in the obituary columns is a casualty list of dying America. That's why we want trial. Because we're relating to the kids. And you see what's happening in Los Angeles right now? They ain't going to take the shit that you take. They're closing down the school system today. Today. Them motherfuckers are 13 years old giving press conferences. <laughs> 13 years old. And they're laying it right out. They're saying it right out. They're saying school is a prison. And education is, that doesn't take place in school. It's only brainwashing and propaganda. And we're not going to take it. And it's happening all over Los Angeles. Think of what's going to happen. The kids are now 8 years old or 15. We can't lose. America is a paper tiger. America is being attacked from every single direction. It's no Vietnam War. It's not a bullshit. It's an Asian war. It's a war all over Asia. It's taking place in Laos, Cambodia, you name it. There's a war going all over Asia, a war going all over Latin America, and a war going all over the United States. We pick up the paper today and it looks like battle reports. Rioting in Berkeley, rioting in Santa Barbara. They try to burn the bank down again in Santa Barbara. Burning down the bank of Santa Barbara was an act of love. Because the Bank of America oppresses and fucks up more people than you can ever count on your thousand hands. There's nothing more violent than the founding of the Bank of America. There ain't going to be such a thing as the Bank of America in six months. If we got anything to do about it, because we're not going to sell our soul to this system, and that's what they want every one of us to do. Sell your soul to the system. And this place right here is the most oppressive institution in this society. The school system is the most oppressive institution in this society. And dig it, the most oppressed people in this country are not black people in Chicago, they're poor people. The most oppressed people in this country are middle class whites because they're born political prisoners in the suburbs and they got nothing to fight for and they're born into security and wealth and they got parents that tell them do this and don't do this and don't do this and don't do this and the purpose of your parents and the purpose of school is to castrate every one of you castrate you by teaching you cynicism by turning into an intellectual, into a fat-headed, middle-class intellectual that doesn't do anything before he gets all the information. And that means never, because you never have all the information. <laughs> and that's why we're getting stoned all the time, because we know that drugs are going to destroy the school system. We know that. We know that when those bells ring, we're going to take a pump, and we're going to say, wow, that's nice music. We ain't going to move. We ain't gonna move when the bell rings. But what they want to teach us to do is to move whenever the bell rings. And work for degrees and diplomas. People here for want a diploma? Is that why you're here? You mean you give up four of the most fantastic energy live years of your life just to get a fucking piece of paper? It ain't worth toilet paper? <laughs> well, let me tell you, it's all a fucking joke. They're laughing at you. The trustees are laughing up there. They're laughing at the fact that they got all you tied up in this concentration camp working for degrees and diplomas that don't mean shit. 
and they got you reading books that are irrelevant and debating, well, they're going out and making money and making war. They're doing the real thing. They got you dealing with words that don't count. If anybody, they got all you living artificial lives. Now, if anybody here wants a diploma or a degree, then you'd be spirit free diplomas. I'll give you a free degree beside anybody you want. Jesus Christ, I don't care, you can name it. You can hang it up on your wall. You can have that diploma. Anything you want. School is nothing more than an advanced form of toilet training. That's what school is, and it's to teach you to become anal personalities. Because America is an anal personality. Anal. Collect everything. Stay tight. Bureaucrat. Anal personalities. That's what taking an examination is. You get all the information into you, all the information, you hold it all in, you hold it all in, you wait for your fucking dictator, authoritarian, bullshit, phony professor to say that a mistake is examination, then you come and you shit on the <laughs> examination. <laughs> That's what school's all about. School's to teach everybody to be toilet trained. To be toilet trained because intellectuals are safe. Just keep it in the library. Just keep debating. Just keep writing books. Doesn't bother anybody. But the moment you act, the moment you go into the streets, the moment you burn the draft card, that's when you find yourself an enemy of the state, a criminal. And we are all enemies of the state. And we gotta free ourselves of this Voluntary concentration camp penitentiary. I learned more in one minute, one minute, in the streets of Chicago than I ever did in 15 years of studying American history, political science, sociology, blah, 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 and all the other ologies and isms and all that bullshit. They divide up into all, so you don't make any sense whatsoever. <laughs> this, this course, that course. It's all to fuck up your mind. Dude, let me tell you something. There is nothing more curious than a baby. A baby wants to touch and feel and be everything. A baby fantasizes. But this system of capitalism has got to destroy that baby. Got to kill that baby. Because if it continues to dream, it may want too much. It may ask too much. It may bother us by going into the streets. So we got to find some way to turn those army of babies into machines. And the way to do it is you put them into schools, babysitting agencies. And that's how babies, alive and curious, are turned into boring and serious and dull adults. We are irresponsible. We are irrational. We are crazy. Because we know, because we know that the Pentagon and the Democratic Party are responsible and they're sane and they're rational. And if that's what that is, then we're the exact opposite. We are the exact opposite of everything our parents stand for. We're the exact opposite of everything the trustees stand for. I was on TV the other day, this guy said to me, you don't take a bath? I haven't taken a bath in six months. I'm obscene. Take the Jefferson airplane. We are all outlaws. We are all criminals. Everybody here is illegal. Dick Spear Agnew. Spear Agnew is right, man. We are misfits. We can't fit in. We don't want to fit in. We don't want to live in the suburbs. We don't want to burn down the suburbs. And so they take that baby and they want to toilet train that baby and prepare it for capitalism. They want to prepare it to be a consumer. Because this country is built on consumption. Now they got big toilet paper. Now they got this kind of car and that kind of car. And living a life is being able to grow up and be a good consumer. What a boring, miserable existence. What a death existence. And so what they do is they train that baby to be a consumer by making it respond to bells, by making it respond to schedules, by making it respect its teachers and its professors, and by working and making it work for grades. And grades are just external rewards that don't mean shit to you internally. They're just the same as working for money, and it's just the same as collecting your shit. Grades, money, shit. It's the same thing psychologically. Same thing psychologically. And it's you, us, that is the victims of this. We live in a fucking country in which the fathers 
and mothers eat their children, kill their children. What the hell is the fucking war in Asia all about? That's a genocidal war against us. It's a genocidal war against America's youth. That's what the war in Vietnam is all about. And you think that TV thing the other day, they had a big story in this platoon in Vietnam. And they interviewed all the soldiers. And the soldiers said, we got the greatest captain in all of the American army. And for about two minutes, they interviewed this soldier, what a great captain he is, what a great captain, what a great captain. I'm trying to figure it out. I was very stoned. I couldn't quite like, why it's so great. And then I've been finding the fact came out. It was said very directly by old Jack Lawrence, a PCBS reporter. He said, it's eight months in which Captain Marcus has been in charge of Platoon 30. They have met the enemy once. <laughs> 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 